I'm excited about the word I have for you today. Um, I have released my first book with Zondervan Pub Publishing, came out last month, called But God Changes Everything. And I look forward to meeting you, signing your copy. It's only $10 out in the lobby. But what I want to talk to you about today is my life story. And my story, I believe, is your story. And I, here's what I know is no matter what we're facing, but God changes everything. And I want to talk to you about that today. Here's what I want to talk to you about. We face giants, but God. Come on, everybody shout, but God. Yeah, yeah, we face giants, but God gives us the victory. And I want to speak to you from 1 Samuel 17. If you have a copy of God's Word or you have a smartphone with a Bible app, Look with me at 1 Samuel 17. I want to pick up reading in verse number 2. We face giants, but God gives us the victory. The Word of God says, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another. With the valley between them, a champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. He was over nine feet tall. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod and its iron point weighed 600 shekels. His shield bearer went ahead of him, Goliath, the giant. The Bible says that he stood around nine and a half feet tall. All the armor that he was wearing all over his body weighed around 200 pounds. And this guy would come out and would talk trash to Israel, to the Israelite army, this big old giant with 200 pounds of armor, nine and a half feet tall. How many of you know Shaquille O'Neal has nothing on homeboy? I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, this brother is big. He's intimidating. He is massive. And this giant stood in between Israel and God's destiny for them. He stood in between Israel and God's future for them. He stood in between Israel and God's victory that he had for the nation of Israel. It was a giant that was in their way and keeping them from victory. And I have fought giants in my own life. I grew up in a little small town called Weewoka, Oklahoma, a town of about 4,000 or so people, a dying little town. And I grew up in a dysfunctional home where there was a lot of chaos and abuse. And at the age of 13, I was sexually abused and molested by a lady who was not my mother. And the abuse went on for several months. And I remember the shame, the guilt. I remember being confused. Is this okay? Is it not okay? I remember the pain. I remember when the molestation, the abuse ended. I remember I didn't tell anybody. And I remember holding my pillow and crying my eyes out. And then at the age of 16, my mom and dad split up, and my mom, my older brother, and my younger sister moved to Rochester, New York from Oklahoma to put distance between my dad and my mom. My mom wanted to put distance between them. And I remember being home. I decided to stay, and we woke up. I was a mama's boy, and I stayed because I wanted to try to get a football scholarship. And I remember my mom left me to tell my dad and my dad came home that evening, and I told him that my, my, bro, my brother, my sister, my mom had left. I was angry. I was bitter. I was confused. I spent that first Christmas without my mom, without my brother, without my sister, just crying my eyes out, wondering if life is really worth living. 
And the only thing I really had going for me at the time is I was, I was a good athlete. I played football, and this is the thing I had going for me. This is the ticket. This is why I stayed back in Oklahoma and didn't go with my mama so I could play football. And now my life is unraveling. I'm bitter. I'm angry. I'm mad. And I find myself on the football field after practice screaming at one of my coaches. You don't understand what I'm going through. You have no idea what happened to me. You don't know what's happening. And I just was unraveling. I know what it is to face giants. And I realize some of you are facing giants in your own life. Perhaps your giant today is a financial giant. Or perhaps it is a broken relationship. Or perhaps like me, you've encountered a lot of pain, a lot of hurt, a lot of trauma. Maybe yours is a giant at work. Maybe it's a health giant. Whatever your giant is, I want to minister to your heart today about six but God giant killing strategies. Six but God giant killing strategies. Number one is this, number one is this, face your giant. Face your giant. You see, when we encounter giants that stand in between us and what God has for us, we can either face the giant or we can flee the giant. But the only way to have a but God victory is to face your giant. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 16, for 40 days. The Philistine, this giant, came forward every morning and evening and took his stand for 40 days. In the morning and in the evening, Goliath, the giant, came out and was talking trash to the Israelite army. I'll whoop you. I'll eat you for lunch. He was defying them. He was defying their God. And for 80, 80 moments, 80 opportunities, 40 days, twice a day he came out. And for 80 opportunities that the Israelite army had to face the giant, they did nothing. And no doubt, the longer they waited, the more intimidated they got. And the more difficult it became to face the giant. And the same thing happens with us. We face giants in life, and the longer we wait to face our giant, oftentimes the more intimidating the giant becomes in our own mind. And we can even get so intimidated by a giant that stands in our way of victory, we start justifying while we're not going to face it. Ah, it's not really that bad. Well, I've been living this way for so long, it's, it's okay. I mean, I don't really think things could really get any, any better. And we start talking ourselves out of what God really has for our lives because of a giant. But when David showed up, a 17-year-old boy shows up at the battle lines. He faced the giant the very day, the very moment he showed up. That day, he faced the giant. I have a question for you today, o Oasis. Did David have the same fear that the other Israelite army folks had, the other men had? Did he face the same fear? Absolutely, yes. He was not some superhero. Matter of fact, here's what Scripture says in 1 Samuel 17, verse 22. It says, David left his things with the keeper of the supplies, ran to the battle lines, and greeted his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the giant, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his battle lines, shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. When the Israelites saw the man, they all ran. Come on, everybody shout all. They all ran from him in great fear. They all ran, including David. Run, Forrest, run. The big boy is out. Get out of here. And they all took off in great fear. But well, here's what I love about David. David did not allow fear and intimidation of a giant to control his life. He gathered, he gathered himself 
and he conquered his fear, and he faced the giant head on that day. And some of you have not faced your giant because you have allowed fear and intimidation of a giant to literally control and to paralyze your life. You know God has more. You know victory is on the other side. But the giant that you're facing has literally paralyzed you and you have been gripped with fear and you're being controlled by a giant. And I want to remind you of the, what the Word of God says in 2 Timothy chapter number 1 and verse number 7. It says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And the fear that you're facing today is not from your heavenly Father. Can I tell you, He's given you power to deal with the giant you're facing. You got to conquer your fear and face your giant so that you can experience but God victory. Number two is this, a, a, a second but God giant killing strategy is you have to overcome discouragement. Overcome discouragement. One, one of the major reasons people don't face their giant is because of discouragement. And David encountered discouragement. It says in first. 1 Samuel 17, verse 28, when Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the desert? You notice how his brother is talking condescending to him? All you do is keep a few sheep. Why are you even here? He goes on to say, I know how conceited you are and how wicked you your heart is, oh, now Eliab has a special gift of reading people's hearts. <laughs> oh, aren't you special, Eliab? That you can now see David's heart and you can tell he's conceited and wicked. He goes on to say, he says this to his little brother, you came down only to watch the battle. Eliab says to his little brother David, the only reason you left daddy's house and you've come down here is you have come to watch the battle. And if I would have been David, I would have said to him, well, Bubba, what have you been doing the last 40 days? <laughs> you haven't bust a grape. Holla, holla at your boy. How many of you glad I'm not David, huh? How many of you glad I'm not David? Here's a fact of life. We all deal with discouragement. Growing up in my little small town and in an abusive home, in a home where there was alcohol addiction and, and gambling addiction. Almost every male that I know in my family has been to jail, to prison, except for me. Growing up and facing sexual abuse and molestation. Growing up and being sexually addicted myself as a teenager. And I remember these words and I know my mom didn't mean them, but they cut me deep. And when my mom got mad at me, she would say to me, you're going to be just like your daddy. You're going to be just like your daddy. And you see, for you to really understand the, the hurt that caused me and the pain it caused me, you see, my dad is Herbert Lee Cooper Sr. and I'm Herbert Lee Cooper Jr. And so you named me after him. And so perhaps what you're saying has validity and just facing discouragement. Will my life really amount to anything? Is my life really worth living? And I realize some of you are facing discouragement today. You've heard words like, you're too young, you're too old, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything. You're stuck. You're going to be where you are the rest of your life. You're a loser. There's no hope for you. Nobody believes in you. Your marriage can't make it. You'll never be happy. You, you, you can't do that. Why do you even think you can't do that? And you have just been bombarded with discouragement. 
encouragement. And I want to come and tell you today, listen, there is victory on the other side of the giant, and you cannot allow discouragement to keep you from facing your giant. And you know what? They are right. They are right. You can't do it. You can't do it. But God can do it. But God can give me strength to do all things through him. I can't, but God. I'm about to preach at Oasis Church today. But God can do it. I'm a living witness. A third giant killing strategy is you must be faithful in the little things faithful in the little things. Notice the word of God in 1 Samuel 17 and verse number 17. It says, now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock with the shepherd, loaded up, and set out as Jesse had directed, as his father had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. And David was faithful in the little things. He was faithful to do a very little, menial task of carrying the bread and the grain and the cheeses down to his brothers. It was just small. It seemed very insignificant. But think about this. If David wouldn't have been faithful in the little to take the bread and cheeses to his brothers, he would have never been in a position to face the giant. But it was being faithful in the little, in the mundane, that put him in the position to face and to get victory over the giant that was intimidating an entire nation. Faithful in the little things. You see, remember this, Oasis, remember this. Small doors can open into big rooms. But it's been faithful in the little that positions us for but God victories over the giants we face in life. See, it's been faithful just to forgive, even though you've been done wrong. It's faithful to love, even though your flesh doesn't feel like it. It's been faithful to turn the other cheek, even when you feel like punching them back in the cheek. It's been faithful to do the little things like choosing a good attitude. How many of you know your attitude is a choice? Oh, no, they, 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 they made me. No, no, no. No, your attitude is your choice. With little in the faithful in the little things like living a life of integrity that honors God. Faithful in the little things like being in church, coming to church every week and worshiping God. Faithful to, to serve and to find a ministry to serve and faithful to, to tithe and, and do the little things, giving offerings above the tithe. Faithful in the little things like praying every day and reading the Word of God every day. Faithful to worship and to bless the name of Jesus Christ. All I'm saying, and I know this from my own experience and I know it from the Word of God, it's being faithful to do the little things just carrying the cheese and carrying the bad bread that positions us for but God victories over giant. And David was faithful to do what his daddy had commanded. And as we're faithful to do what our heavenly father has told us to do, when we don't know what to do, just do what we know to do and obey the word of God. And it positions us for but God victories. N number four is this. Number four is this. A fourth giant killing strategy is remember how God has helped you in the past. You see, when you're facing a giant, you have to remember. I want to encourage you. Remember how God has helped you in the past. You see, before David faced Goliath, he remembered how God helped him in the past. 
Scripture records in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 34, but David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping, the, keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Oasis, can I tell you that David is a bad mama jamma. <laughs> the brother is fighting lions. The brother is fighting bears with his bare hands. He, is, he says, listen, you don't understand, Mr. King. I know there is a huge giant that's in the way, and what you don't understand is I remember how God helped me when I was just keeping the sheep. Nobody else was around. There wasn't any newspaper. There was no CNN or Fox. Nobody was there but me. But when, the, when I was protecting the sheep, a lion came. Pow, yow. A bear came, I handled my business because God helped me get the victory over the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be just like that lion and that bear. God will give me the victory. The same God that gave me strength back then will give me strength today. Oasis. I just want to say this to you as I'm out in the lobby and maybe slip outside and signing copies of the book and we're outside and I know this is LA and not Oklahoma, but if we are out there in the lobby and, and then we get, slip outside and we see a lion or a bear, all I'm saying is you better be able to run <laughs> fast because I'm not killing no lion or no bear, I'm out running you. Come on, somebody. I'm not David. Come on, come on. I'm not David. <laughs> Here's what I'm saying, Oasis. I remember how God has helped me in the past. You see, I still face giants today, but I remember how God helped me with sexual abuse and how he healed my heart. I remember how God helped me overcoming the bitterness in my heart. And the unforgiveness, because I did not want to forgive. But God helped me. I remember when my parents divorced, and I thought my life was over. I wondered how I could make it. And I looked back at how God brought me through. I looked back at the anger I had growing up in a dysfunctional, dysfunctional environment. And I look how God help me overcome giants. And I still face giants today, but I draw strength from where God has brought me from. Is there anybody else? You may be 15, 12, 99. Has he brought you a mighty long ways? Come on, draw strength from where the Lord has brought you from. And will give you strength to face the giants today. Number five is this. There's a fifth giant killing strategy. And that is to remember God is bigger than your giant. I really want this to minister to your heart. Open your heart up as I read the Word of God. I want you to see how David focused on how God was bigger than the giant that he was facing. In 1 Samuel 17, verse 45, it says, David said to the Philistine, to this giant, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. Come on, how many know sometimes you just got to talk to the giant? Come on, yeah, talk to the depression. Come on, talk to the pain. Come on, I, I, you come against me with spear and sword and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. Here's what David is saying, Bubba, you're big, but my God is bigger. He says, I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty. He says, the God of the army of Israel. He says, yeah, you're big, but God is bigger, whom you have defied. He says, verse 46, this day the Lord will hand you over to me. Yeah, you're big, but God is bigger, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Today, I 
I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world, the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. Yeah, you're big, but God is bigger. Verse 47, and all those gathered here will know that it is not, it is not by sword or by spear that the Lord saves. He says, my God is bigger. And I love this. He says, for the battle is the Lord's. Come on, somebody's fighting a giant right now. It looks big. Come on, that battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's, and you're going to get victory because God is bigger than your giant. And he says, the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And Oasis, when you're facing a giant, remember, God is bigger. Don't focus on how big your giant is. You focus on how big your God is. God is bigger than any problem. He's bigger than any financial struggle. He's bigger than any broken relationship. He's bigger than any addiction you may be facing. He's bigger than pain. He's bigger than abuse. He's bigger than heartache. God is bigger than any giant that you face. Your giant may be big, but God is bigger. God is bigger. God is bigger. God is bigger. Number six is this, a sixth giant killing strategy. Realize blessings follow defeating giants. Blessings follow defeating giants. You see, whoever defeated Goliath was going to receive major blessings. Check this out, 1 Samuel 17, verse 25. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out. He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him blessings. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his father's family from taxes in Israel. I don't know about you, but I would just take the tax exemption. Come on, somebody. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Hey. Here's what I want you to understand. When you face your giant, I want you to realize there's a blessing on the other side. There's a blessing on the other side of the giant that you're facing in life. You see, I faced some big giants. And the abuse and the molestation and the pain and the bitterness, screaming at my coach and my parents divorced and I'm lonely and hurting. It was a Thursday night and we woke Oklahoma. I was being recruited by a university on the East Coast and I was supposed to meet the coach that was there to recruit me that night. My phone rang and the coach said, Herbert, I can't make it down until tomorrow, I'm in Oklahoma City, and I'll be in Wewoka tomorrow. I'll pull you out of class and meet with you about our university. I was disappointed, but I had heard that there was a fellowship of Christian athletes meeting at the Wewoka High School football locker room. I didn't really care to go, but the only reason I went was because they were serving free pizza. Come on, somebody. <laughs> hey! And I went that night for free pizza, and I sat on a football locker, and Todd Thompson, the former kicker for the Oklahoma Sooners, shared about Jesus Christ and his love and his forgiveness, and there was hope in him. And as a captain of the football team, a senior in high school, at that moment, I didn't care what anybody thought. In that moment, tears streamed down my face, and I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And I can't explain it to you, all that happened in my life that moment. And the best way I can sum it up is, but God changed everything in my life. I was set free from addiction. I knew what it was to have peace and joy. I can't believe today that I'm a pastor of a church 
Some people say, did you grow up in a pastor's home? Ha! <laughs> yeah. Been in ministry for 20 years. The blessings on the other side of the giant. And then the most beautiful gift that God has given me is my precious wife. You say, you couldn't have a healthy marriage after all the dysfunction you grew up in, but God. I've been married to my precious wife for 17 years, and we have four precious kids. Ch ch check out my family. But God! Hey! Hey, Lord! Thank you, Jesus! Peter, patter! Let me at her! Glory to God! I would be a statistic, but God. I would be in jail, but God. I would be dead, but God. I would be addicted, but God. After all the hell I've been through, I would have lost my mind, but God. I should be bitter today, but God. I would have no hope, but God changes everything. Praise your Lord. Give your praise today, Lord. Give your praise today, Lord. Give your praise that you change everything. Give your glory that you turn our lives around. Give your praise that you take our misery and turn it into a ministry. Give your praise today that you take our tragedy and turn it into triumph. Father, I bless you today for what you're doing in the hearts and lives of people right now. And I'm grateful that people are having but God encounters right now. Father, we face giants. But God, you give us the victory. And I thank you right now, God, that you're ministering to hearts and people are facing giants, realizing there is victory and blessing on the other side of the giant that they're facing. Give us strength. Give us courage. Help us by the power of your spirit to get victory over the giants we face in life so that we can be all that you called us to be and do all that you've called us to do. In Christ Jesus, we pray. His eyes are still closed and just heads are bowed around this place and you're here today and you find yourself far from God. Like I was when I stumbled into a football locker room at the age of 17 and you find yourself far from God and living wild and just kind of doing what you want to do and you haven't surrendered your life to Jesus. And as I shared my story, you're, you're thinking to yourself, wow, I need a moment like that. I need a but God encounter. And this God that you're talking about, Herbert, that's so full of grace and mercy and love that he sent his only son to die on the cross for our sins. And he rose again on the third day with all power in his hands. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father today, ready to give you a but God encounter of his grace, of his mercy, of his forgiveness. You say, wow, he really loves me that much, that he would forgive me. Yes, he does. He'll wash away your sins. He'll begin to change you from the inside out. If that's you today, you'd like to experience God's grace today, God's mercy today, God's forgiveness today. You'd like to have a but God encounter today. As I count to three, if that's you, you want to surrender your life to Jesus. You want to have your sins forgiven. You want to be made right with God. Would you just slip your hand in the air as I count to three? And I want to lead you in a prayer to accept Jesus today as your Lord and as your Savior. One, two, three. Just lift your hand up high. Thank you so much. See your hand. Thank you so much. See your hand there. Thank you so much. See your hand. Others today, I want to surrender my life to Jesus Christ and say, Yes to him today. Oh, thank you for the hands that are raised around this building. I'm going to ask this right there in your seat. Just pray this prayer with me. Just confess it with your mouth and believe it in your heart. In Romans 10 and verse number 9 says, If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Pray with me now, Jesus. I realize I've sinned against you, but I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I believe you rose again on the third day 
with all power in your hands. And Jesus, I turn away from my life of sin, and I turn my life completely over to you. I confess you as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you so much for loving me, for forgiving me, for pouring out your grace and mercy over my life today. I'll follow you the rest of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I love you, Oasis, but God changes everything.